and welcome back to another episode of What the Forensics. My name is Rebecca, and I am joined here again by the lovely Journey and Nicole. This week, we are going to be doing kind of a topic discussion instead of uh, two separate uh, case in science. So we are all going to be telling you the case study of the Is Doll Woman, um, and then kind of talking and discussing the theories around it, who she might be, and what could have led to her death. I would also like to note that there is a lis- listener's discretion advised, as there are detailed descriptions of suicide. Um, but with that out of the way, let's get started. So, on November 29th, 1970, a woman's body was found by a hiker and his two daughters in Norway's Ice Valley, which is a few miles outside of a city called Bergen. The hiking family returned to Bergen and reported the body that they had found and described her as, quote, burned beyond recognition, end quote. When the police officers went to retrieve her body, they commented on how it smelled, kind of like burning or burnt meat. And then the officers also described that the path that they had to take to get to the body, um, they described that as a scree, which is basically an unstable steep mountain slope that's made up of a whole bunch of rock fragments and other debris. Um, So it's not really a proper hiking trail at all. Um, which is quite interesting. Um, so then my kind of question is, um, how did they find her? Like that hiking family, how did they find her if it's off the beaten path a little bit? Um, but we'll discuss that later. Uh, and this area too, this ice valley, um, I think it's also known as like Death Mountain. What was it? Yeah, Death Mountain is also what it's known as. Um, There's a couple podcasts. I know at least one BBC podcast that exists that is solely a 12-part series about um, the Isdal woman. Um, You can listen if you want. We'll discuss more about that later. So wait until until we have our conversation. Um, But yes, once they arrived at the body, the police, um, they kind of threw some theories out with each other as to like why she ended up burned on the side of a mountain in Norway um, and how she got there. And so these theories kind of included her either like falling into a fire and then kind of stepping or recoiling backwards um, and maybe falling down a cliff that way or the side of the mountain that way. Um, There's also theories thrown around that she was killed by someone and then set on fire. However, though, there was no signs of fire anywhere else except where her body was found. And so it was basically like just her body was burnt and not much else. And she was found laying on her back, kind of wedged between some rocks, and only her front was burned. So it wasn't even like there was... um, like debris or foliage and trees or grass around her to be burned. It was just a lot of rocks. Um, but police described her to be about four or sorry, five foot four, five foot four and a half inches tall. Um, and between the ages of 25 and 40, she is believed or she was believed to have brown eyes, a small round face and small ears. And her long brownish black hair was tied back into a ponytail when they found her. Um, she is seen when they were fa- or sorry, when she was found, um, police noticed that she had a gap in her two front teeth that's suspected to have given her a little bit of a lisp. And she had 14 fillings and several gold crowns. And at the time and while at this location, it was kind of unusual in Scandinavia for that to happen. Like it was um, more of a Southern European thing, I believe. Like it wasn't a Nordic Scandinavian custom to get gold crowns um, in this time period. So keep that in mind, I will say. Keep it in mind. Back of your head. (laughs) Yeah, and so when she was found, she was found in what's known as a boxer's pose, or it's also scientifically known as the pugilistic posture. Um, And so it's seen in victims of severe burns. And this pose happens when fire makes the muscles shrink, which causes the joints to flex. And so your hands will ball into fists and your elbows and knees will bend. And if you were to kind of stand the body up, it would look like they were squatted down, like ready to box with someone, as the name would suggest. 
And we're going to put a photo up of what the posture looks like on our website, not of this person, but of like a, a diagram of what it looked like, because some images of this posture can be quite haunting. Um, I'm still haunted by an image from my forensic anthropology class that what my, when we were learning about this, my professor showed us and it still haunts me. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, and so some other evidence that was present didn't really line up with what is typically seen in burn victims found in this pugilistic posture, because typically for this posture to happen, a lot of heat is required, and therefore the majority of the victims are found with full body burns. However, the majority of burning seen with the Isdal woman was to her front, with very little burning to her back. Um, we can kind of, it kind of makes it look like or feel like she was burned like laying down almost like the fire couldn't like reach around down. to her back yeah as bad as it sounds i kind of think of the broiler on an oven um, yes that's exactly <laughs> what it would be like <laughs> yeah <laughs> a, t- a terrible but effective comparison um okay so some other belongings that were found burned and scattered around her include some clothes one rubber boot that was not on her foot a watch earrings and a ring, plastic bottles that were melted, the plastic cover for a passport that was also melted, um, an umbrella, a bottle of cloister liqueur, and a fur hat that had some gas molecules in it. Um, All of the labels and tags were removed from every item that was found with her, and her watch was stopped at the time 1010. And according to the BBC podcast, that is the time that watches are set to when they are on display in the store. Um, I don't think that that's why that watch was set to 1010, but that's my opinion. Um, the placement of these objects was also suspect. Um, some people thought they were kind of suspicious because, um, they were placed around her in some kind of ceremony and like neatly laid out by her body. Um, and so it kind of makes you question, like, did someone go through her stuff and spread it around her or was it thrown off the mountain with her? Um, did they intentionally burn her body and then lay out these items in ceremony or was she just stopped for food and laid out her cooking and eating utensils and led like set them out around her by herself, not expecting to be burned, but we don't know. So once, uh, her body was found with all of these, um, items found at the crime scene too, there was an autopsy performed on her. Uh, This autopsy was able to determine her cause of death and also some other interesting evidence. And so they determined cause of death to be a combination of incapacitation by phenobarbital, so basically an overdose, and then poisoning by carbon monoxide. They also found soot in her lungs, and this would have meant that she was burned while still alive and still breathing. So as she was inhaling, that burning was entering her system. Her neck was also bruised. Um, This possibly could have been from a fall or a blow. Um, This couldn't really be determined, though. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, She was also found with 50 to 70 sleeping pills in her stomach and a concentrated amount of them uh, in her blood. And so I'm not sure if that was like 50 to 70 capsules that hadn't been fully digested yet. Um which could possibly mean there were more that had been digested and then that was concentrated in her bloodstream. Um, But kind of the takeaway from this is she had a lot of sleeping pills in her system, regardless of what was already in her stomach and what might have um, dissolved or been absorbed by the body. And as mentioned before, she also had multiple teeth with gold crowns or fillings in them. And as I mentioned, gold filling uh, dentistry was not used or not really used in Scandinavian countries in the 1970s. Um, At the time, these were primarily used in parts of Southern and Central Europe. And so the medical examiner ended up removing her teeth and her jaw because of how unique these fillings were um, for like someone to be found in a Scandinavian country. And he or they also took tissue samples of her organs um, to be held as evidence in case that, you know, future analysis and examination had to occur. 
Yeah, we'll put a photo up of her teeth and like her jaw yeah. and stuff because it's crazy the amount of dental work. Because like I had pictured something completely different until I saw the image and I was like, holy cow, like that definitely is an anomaly. Even in today's age to have like that many visible fillings and like different kinds of fillings is crazy. It's almost her whole mouth. And I yeah. was reading like the autopsy report. I didn't quite understand all of it because it was about like um, like specifics on each tooth. And I don't know how autopsy examiners like count the teeth, you know, <laughs> um, but by the looks of it, unless she lost the tooth, it even looks like they just kind of put like a, a gold filling between two teeth where she was missing a tooth altogether. And I feel mm. like her jaw wouldn't have lost the tooth if the gold was keeping it in place. So that was a bit weird, but that's just a bit of a tangent on the fact that I think she had a lot of dental work. <laughs> I was not expecting like her full teeth to be like, it looks like she has fake gold teeth, like a grill almost in it. Like I was yeah. just expecting like fillings. Um, so that was shocking to see. She'd probably have one bright smile out in the sun that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah right oh especially because like her front like her top two um incisors are um completely gold yeah so you'd think yeah. that would have been like something that would have made her stand out and like i don't know because we can only see the back like we can't see like them from the front so yeah. we don't know if like the front and the sides i guess are gold but from like the um that like looking from the top of your teeth, you can yeah. see a lot of gold. And those would be All like my two knowledge is escaping me. I know. Same. Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, her two front teeth too. You can kind of see the gap there as well. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like that would be a pretty prominent thing to remember in someone. And we'll get into it a bit further too, but I feel like a lot of the eyewitness testimony or statements I don't think any talk about the teeth. None of them do. Yeah. Which is strange because I feel like that's – I don't know if it's just me, but I look at the mouth a lot when people talk. One, to see, you know, what they're saying, but expression as well. I feel like that's just something you would notice. Yeah. Like, especially if someone has a gap in their front teeth, that's usually, like, very obvious. Yeah. So, yeah. No, that's so weird. Um, okay. Um, so the police decided to post that they had discovered her body everywhere with the hopes that someone would come forward to identify her. And roughly three days after the body was discovered, someone came forward who worked at the Bergen train station to say that there were suitcases left there that no one had come to claim or had paid to hold them there longer than one week. Um, and so the suitcases were left in a locker on the 23rd of November, which was six days before her body was found. Uh, the police were able to match a fingerprint from a pair of glasses in the suitcase to the body to confirm that these suitcases were hers. I have so many issues with that. M most of it. <laughs> we'll post what the fingerprints look like and then you'll understand <laughs> yeah my first issue is that she was in boxer's pose and when you're boxing someone your hands are in tight fists so i do not know how they like got her Unfurled fingers her out fingers. of it yeah without like breaking the skin or breaking like disturbing the evidence because i feel like when your skin is burned it's going to be fairly brittle so like undoing it isn't going to work especially if she was burned to the degree that she was and i feel like um, they're not rehydrating the body in 1970 to like try to safely well, <laughs> i don't even know if you can do that because if you stick something that's charred in water the that's, char just like flakes off very true this is very true so yeah i don't know and yeah you'll see when we post the fingerprints <laughs> um they're just <laughs> i do not understand how they made a positive identification with that yeah, we get more into this later on. Mm -hmm. And so some of the contents of the suitcases were the prescription fee gla prescription free glasses with a fingerprint on the lens. So they were purely just for show. Um, more clothes without tags. There was a wig or two, a comb and a hairbrush. Um, there was a notebook. And this notebook is very interesting because it was full of codes and so from this notebook, they were also able to obtain a handwriting sample, which came into play later. Um, I also have issues with that, but that's for later. 
Eventually, they were also able to decode some of the codes in there, and they corresponded to hotel stays and cities uh, where the hotels were. So there were some codes that that they weren't able to decode either. And the one that they struggled with is ML23NMM. And so there had been many attempts to understand what it means. They were able to figure out that 23N is thought to be the 23rd of November, as this type of dating system is seen throughout the notebook. So there have been other dates like 3A for the 3rd of April and then an initial for the city that she was in at that time. Um, But the ML and the MM are especially confusing. And one article that I read suggested that ML stands for main lune in Latin, which translates to Monday morning, and MM, which could be memento mori, which is remember you will die. And so with this, the code now says Monday morning, November 23rd, remember you will die. Um, we don't know if that's true. She did die, or like the 23rd of November is a Monday morning. Yeah, I was going to say, so like... <clears throat> my little notes that i wrote up on my thoughts um yeah i figured the mm would stand for that either monday morning or the Mm -hmm. momentum or monte Monte sorry no sorry the ml which translates to monday morning that's what i was thinking the mm um monday like november 23rd 1970 was in fact a monday so i could Mm -hmm. see the first part indicating monday somehow or even mm being like monday morning and then ml being the initials of maybe someone she was meeting yeah like i yeah yeah. i agree with that i kind of read it it as monday morning on november 23rd initial of someone but there's many variations and things yeah we just don't know yeah that's the one code that has kind of like escaped everyone because we just we don't know what those letters are. We don't know enough about this person to kind of make sense. And it is weird that the 23rd of November is the date that was mentioned, but it's also the date that she went missing, supposedly. Um, there was also a matchbox from an erotic underwear store. And apparently there was also one found at the crime scene. I only saw that in one article, so I don't know how true it is. Um There's a Norwegian roadmap with the names of train stations from Oslo to Bergen listed on the top in her handwriting. There were some cosmetics all with like their labels um, like rubbed off so you can't tell where they were from. And there was also eczema cream. And so the label was rubbed off the eczema cream as well. Um, But they were able to see that it was from a pharmacy in Bergen. There were some like teaspoons. Um not like the measuring tool, but like spoons that were used for tea. Um, There's currency from Germany, Norway, Belgium, England, and Sweden. There was a bag from a shoe store in Stavanger. Um, And so when investigators traveled to Stavanger, the owner's son said that he had sold a pair of rubber boots, supposedly the ones that were found with her body, to, quote, a very well-dressed, nice-looking woman with dark hair, end quote, And he remembered that she was very indecisive when buying the boots and took a while before actually purchasing them. And the seller said that she had a bad smell around her, kind of like garlic. Um, She was wearing a faux fur jacket and had hair down to her shoulders and had size 38 feet, which is about eight and a half. And he also said she had an accent when she spoke English, but he didn't recognize where the accent was from. This was kind of like the biggest break in the case. Um, but yeah, there was also a compass. There were some slippers that were worn out, uh, but Italy could be made out on the label. And there was a sewing kit from a hotel in Geneva. And speaking of hotels, um, she, these, this is the woman very much enjoyed her hotel stays. Um, but oddly enough, like all of these items in the suitcase have somehow been lost, uh, in time since they were first found by the police. So I don't know if they lost the evidence or like after a certain amount of time, it just kind of go disappears to make room for the next. But yeah, so her passports were also never found. And the passport numbers that she included on hotel cards were fake. I'm going to show my age here for a second. 
I don't know what like hotel cards are or like why you would need a passport number for it. But like, I guess it makes sense if you're using it as identification. My understanding is just that they're like a customs form where you just, because I was like looking at the other ones, it's just like, where are you yeah. from? Where are you going? How long are you planning on staying? Like, what's your passport number? And it was just oh. a way of like checking into the hotel. So kind of just like what they're online check and registry would be mm-hmm. like but like why would they need to, to know that information i guess it's different back know. then during yeah the time but interesting yeah. okay mm-hmm. huh but yes so anyways i guess all these numbers that she included were fake but what the weird thing is like about this is a lot of the articles that we read um in like the podcast and stuff that we were listening to they said that the passports were found though so yeah. There was just, like, I don't know if that's a chain of custody thing. They were there one second, gone the next, and no one thought to, like, raise an alarm for it. But we don't know where they are I'm pretty are sure the podcast we listened to did say that they weren't found, but a lot of the articles said that they were found. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, and, like, a lot of them said, like, they were in the suitcases. Yeah. They've all kind of melded together as one at this point, so I can't mm-hmm. remember who said what, and they're all kind of... Yeah, uh, differing in what they say so i don't know <laughs> um but going back to the notebook that journey had talked about uh investigators were actually able to link some of the codes with dates um to hotel stays and as they looked into these days at the hotel they learned that um the isol woman had many different aliases that she was she was using and they were able to match the hotel cards to her by her handwriting um, this I will touch on later when we do t- round table discussion. Um, but some of these aliases include, uh, Jean Viev Lan- Lancier, Lancier from Louvain. Genevieve, Genevieve, Genevieve Lance. I it looked so French. I was like, <laughs> Jean Viv. <laughs> yes. Okay. No, it's just like Genevieve, I think. Genevieve. I think depending yeah. on the region, it's either Genevieve or Jean Genevieve. Jean I've heard Jean Genevieve. Like, oh, I've never heard no. that. There's something. I feel like it's like only pronounced like that in French. You know? Yeah. I'm not really sure, but. Well, where anyways, is- <laughs> yeah. Some um, some of her aliases included though Genevieve Lancer Lancer from um, Louvain, who stayed at Viking Hotel in Oslo, March twenty first to twenty fourth, nineteen seventy. Claudia Tielt from Brussels, who stayed in Hotel Scandia in Bergen on March twenty fifth, nineteen seventy, and then Hotel Bristol in Bergen from March 26th to April 1st, 1st, 1970. So already this is a couple weeks, just straight hotel stays. And then she also used an alias Claudia Nielsen from Ghent, who stayed in KNA Hotelette in Stanvanger um, from October 29th to 30th. She also went by Alexia Zarn Merchez from... Libuania, but she stayed in Neptune Hotel there uh, in Bergen. Sorry, from Libuania, who stayed in Bergen at Neptune Hotel on October 30th. So she had um, two hotel stays on October 30th, but then this one went to November 5th. And then she also went by Vara Vara Jarl from Antwerp who stayed in Hotel Bristol in Trodenheim from November 6th to 8th. So pretty well from middle of March to the end of April, no, the beginning of April hotel stays and then end of October to November, like two week periods. It seems like Um, Mm -hmm. March to April and then November, October to November, she was in hotels. Um, Oops, she also had Finella Lork, who supposedly was staying in Stan- Stavanger um, at the hotel across the street from the shoe, sto- shoe shop from November 9th to November 18th. However, her hotel card for the stay was lost by police um, 
somehow. And this was the first hotel card that had the police look at other hotels for information about her. And then this led to um, the decoding of the notebook as well. I don't mean to say anything about police and Mm -hmm. the evidence, but Mm -hmm. they seem to be losing a lot of evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, sorry, misplacing it. It just disappears. Like, I don't understand how you can have a missing persons case and then, or like a found body that doesn't belong to anyone and you just lose everything in the case. Like, how are you expected to solve that? And when did you lose it? And why are you not getting in crap for losing it? Like, n- it never yeah. comes up being like, that's not good. Don't do that. Stop that. It right? just, evidence goes missing. And now we're talking about, oh, mm, sucks. Evidence went missing. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Great. <laughs> um, she also went by uh, Elizabeth Leanhauer, um, who stayed in Hotel Rosencrantz in Bergen from November 18th to 18th journey correct me on that one um i think that's supposed to be 19th it was only supposed to be like one night okay and yeah, then yeah. she moved to a different hotel okay um yeah so then on november 19th to the 23rd 1970 she stayed at the hotel hordenheimen in bergen um yeah, so this one is a bit more questionable. She, the handwriting is very different from the others on this key or on this um, hotel card. But the like the analysts who took a look at all of the these hotel cards and her writing say that it was written by the same person. So who knows? Um, another source though said that her handwriting indicates French schooling, even if she spoke German fluently. I myself have no idea how you can tell where you grew up writing like how it was just writing she made some mistakes spelling german words so they were like oh she learned german as a second language but as we find out later on she has like german roots so she can speak german fluently she just writes in a french way i guess yeah but see that's funny which just brings me to another point i had on my list um i speak english english is my first language i am so illiterate when i write sometimes like if someone Mm -hmm. saw my writing they could be like oh english is not her first language like so i don't see how that they're making that connection between like oh she misspelled some german words so she she probably isn't german like that to me kind of sets up off some alarm bells so I don't know. I just want to have a conversation with these handwriting analysts or analysts, mm-hmm. see what they were thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and these hotel hotel cards gave investigators the majority of their information on this case. And additionally, they were able to learn that German wasn't her first language, just like we had said, um, because of these. So she had also written down that she was an antique dealer or um, she was there at the hotel to trade goods, um, something like this on one of her cards because it had translated to, quote, trade professionals, end quote. Um, her birth year also changed and it varied between like 1943 and 1945. All of the passport numbers, too, that she gave, like I said, were fake and they were able to trace her aliases um, and her hotel call- cards all the way to Paris as well, which I thought was quite interesting. So she's made quite the trek. Yeah. And so um, with all these hotel stays, it's no it's no surprise that people actually saw her in these hotels. And so a waitress from one of the hotels where she stayed recalled seeing her. She told BBC, quote, my first impression of her was one of elegance and self-assuredness. In fact, I remember her winking at me. From my perspective, it felt as though she thought I had been staring a bit too much at her, end quote. Um, She remembers that the Istal woman or the supposed Istal woman sat with two Navy personnel, one of which was an officer, but they didn't talk to each other. She also said that she was seen with a different man in the dining room and neither of them spoke to each other, but she passed him a note and he kind of became somber after. Um, There have been different accounts as to whether uh, like the first account was them at the same table or if they were just kind of like sitting next to each other. Um, We're not totally sure. And at almost every hotel, this is kind of peculiar because there was someone there who remembered seeing her 
even f- almost 50 years after this case happened. So that's kind of odd. Um, but in one hotel, the housekeepers remember her moving an armchair into the hallway whenever she was in the room and then moving it back into the room when she left. Um, they weren't allowed to go in and clean her room, but when they noticed the chair wasn't in the hallway, they would go in and do it anyways. Um, in another hotel in Bergen on November 18th, a maid supposedly walked in on her and a man. Uh, the Isda woman sat on the bed while the man sat on the couch, and the maid described their mood and what they were wearing like they were almost in mourning. And the Isda woman left the hotel the next day, and so, like, was she supposed to stay there longer, but then she was walked in on, or was the plan always to change location? Like, we're just not sure. Now is where the eyewitness accounts get real sketch. So in 2019, a man came forward to say that he had met the Istal woman in Forbach in the summer of 1970. He said that he was 22 at the time and she was 26 or 27. And they talked about painting and art, but she didn't want to talk about her life and her work. Uh, Quote, I met a woman in a bar in the mining town in the summer of 1970. We saw each other for two or three weeks. She said she was passing through a tourist who was staying with friends. She was the one who told me where and at what time we would see each other. End quote. These are just some of the things that he said to um, either. I don't know if it was the police or if it was just like the journalist who found him. He also said, quote, She had a Balkan accent. The woman whose name I unfortunately forgot spoke several languages. Her German was almost perfect. Her French more academic, end quote. Um, So that can kind of lead to the, or support the, um, like she went to French schooling, I guess. Kind of weak, but whatever. Um, He talked about phone calls she would receive and said, quote, they took place in a room. She knew the time of the calls. She would put on music so that I wouldn't hear. I heard a man's voice speaking a language I didn't know. It sounded to me like it was always worried during calls. She said she had several papers and passports that allowed her to cross the Berlin Wall and go to East Germany without any problem. I rummaged through her things. She had two suitcases, not very large. There were wigs inside. She was also carrying two bags with very colorful clothes in them. Sometimes she would turn into an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old. She was very good at changing her appearance. It was amazing. It was during the Cold War for a few weeks. I wanted to go to the authorities, the police, or the gendarmerie. Um, I was afraid, end quote. Um, we don't know what he was afraid of because it kind of goes like, he. Or I was afraid, dot, 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 indicating that there was more to that sentence. So I would like to know what they left out. Um, and apparently he stole a photo of her as a memento and... Um, we'll put that photo on our website. There is resemblance, but it's just a photo of a brunette woman with bangs on a horse. And so it could be anyone. It could have been my mom or my grandma or me, really. Like, I know lots of women who are brunettes with bangs. Just exactly. saying. Yeah. Like, she looks a lot like my grandma when she was younger. Right. And there's nothing like distinguishable about it. It's a side profile mm-hmm. image. You only get half the face. You don't get an idea of height or anything like that. It's very yeah. ambiguous. Yeah. Exactly. I know we're going to talk a little bit later. We already have talked about like how many eyewitness accounts came out like after they reopened the case. So I'm not going to like go on a tangent right now. Uh, but it is, it is pretty peculiar that they didn't reach out like 50 what however many years ago that was before and now they're like oh they're reopening a really famous case i might have met someone with brown hair in norway in the 70s it was right it It just doesn't seem right to me (laughs) yeah exactly i agree and so another possible sighting of the estal woman was by the italian photographer giovanni trimboli And one of his postcards was supposedly found in her suitcases, and apparently he did confirm that he gave it to her after he invited her for dinner. Um, And he even took her for a trip in his car, and she told him that she was a South African saleswoman who specialized in antiques. Uh, She also told him that she had six months to see all of the exciting places in Norway. Um, They were seen together a few other times in different cities, Uh, When Trimboli was investigated in 1971, he changes his stories a couple times when he's talking about the woman he was seen with. And when he gave investigators a name, they were able to locate the woman. 
So she was obviously not the Istal woman because she was alive. And this woman didn't live where Trimboli said she would, and she wasn't a student like he said either. And police didn't ask her if she had been in Norway at the time. Why they wouldn't do that, I do not know. Um, but it is possible that Trimboli gave them a fake name and kind of got lucky when there was someone with that name. That's kind of my thought is that maybe he was with the Istalum, but she didn't want to be found. So he gave them a fake name and whatever. Um, and so this next part is kind of confusing because later on in the article, it says the postcard didn't come from Trimboli himself. Um, apparently he gave the postcard to a hotel manager who then gave it to a woman he met who's supposedly the Isdal woman. And the hotel manager didn't think it was available in stores yet because it showed a winter theme. And I think this was taking place in October. And apparently the postcard was found with the Isdal woman and it had the same serial number as the one the hotel manager gave the woman. How the hotel manager knows what serial number was on the postcard, I do not know. But that's or if if he's writing them down, why is he writing down other people's postcard numbers? Yeah, right. Like it just seems weird. And then why would Trimboli be like, "Oh yeah, I gave her the postcard." Uh, yeah, I don't know. But also, like, did Trimboli know the serial number of his postcard? Like, was he like, "Oh yeah, that's my postcard. I know that one because of the serial yeah, number." Right? Does he like scan them and then give them to someone? Like, oh, X postcard went to ABC. Yeah, because that'd be weird. Food for thought. <laughs> More mm-hmm. questions to this already questionable case. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Um, so another witness came forward and said that he saw her exchanging money with a man on November 23rd, the day she went missing. This was before she had checked out of the hotel, so it's most likely that she was just settling accounts and paying for her room. She then got into a taxi and went to the railway station where she checked in the suitcases. In 1991, the taxi driver came forward to say that they were joined by another man before they reached the train station. How they proved that this was the same taxi driver that drove her on that day, I will never know. Um, and then someone on November 22nd noticed a funnel of smoke while they were going to a lake in the Ice Valley. Um, they said the smoke dissipated soon after they noticed it. Um, we don't know how true this is. But if it is true, then the Istal woman um, was not the person walking around on the 23rd of November. Uh, there are also other descriptions of fire in the area around November 23rd as well. Most reported that they saw a fire on 12 p.m. that day. Um, what I would like to know about that is they didn't find the body for six more days. So when they found the body, because they noticed a smell, they said it kind of smelled like burning meat or burnt meat. But was the body, like, still warm? Or was there any indication of it recently being on fire? Like, wouldn't you also see... Sorry to interrupt, but, like, if they're saying that the body wasn't found for six days, like, she went missing on the Monday, found the Sunday, Mm -hmm. would there not be decomp present at that point? Or was it so fresh that maybe she was just killed and found on that Sunday? Like, where was she for those days prior if she wasn't dead? Exactly. Well, and was she dead and she was moved? Was there any animal predation? Yeah, it didn't look like it um, from the photo. Yeah, and so that to me kind of feels like she was fairly freshly dead. Yeah, she's not there long. Um, mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm not totally sure. I would just like to know what it was like when they found her and if they could kind of do any kind of determination of when she was last on fire. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I just have a feeling that those fires on November 23rd were not her. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we kind of mentioned it, too. And it's interesting that um, while, you know, the police evidence, they really said that this woman had a gap between her teeth. Her teeth show this in her actual jawbone from the um, that the medical examiner took. Um, like we mentioned, none of the eyewitnesses actually describe her as having a gap in her teeth. Um but her remains clearly do have a gap. So I, f- like, I don't know if they're just thinking about someone else. And so there's some discrepancies mm-hmm. when it comes to those eyewitness testimonies because, you know, everyone kind of has their own account. My thing, I, I mean, we'll talk about this later too, but like, how do you remember 50 years ago? And a lot of these people are coming forward 50 plus years later. Like, no, not, not to say no one because people did come forward, but like... 
the majority of these people are coming forward when the case was reopened. They have yeah, to remember that. And if, especially if well, it's someone in passing. Sorry. Oh, it's all good. I was just going to say that's kind of what's so concerning. Like thinking back to when we were talking about eyewitness testimony, like in an episode yeah. a while ago, it's the human brain is like very. Ma- I, I, I want to say malleable because I don't have a better word, mm-hmm. but like really, really easy to convince someone they saw something they didn't. Yeah. Or like even just the face you saw, like. I think I've heard something that's like every time you remember something, you're remembering the last time you remembered it. So it slightly changes yeah. every time. Yeah. And so yeah. it's like, given how famous this case is, there's probably at least some likelihood these people have seen her picture like multiple times prior to coming forward. And they've probably like they might genuinely believe it was her. Mm-hmm. But whether or not it was is pretty questionable, given how long it took to come forward. And there's no evidence to suggest like yeah. to support their case. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. Yeah. I find it interesting too. Like there was an eyewitness like kind of going on about that was he came forward and, you know, after the fact, he was like, Oh, I really, I, I regret not having gone to the police sooner when he came forward in 2018. Um, and the account that he gave saying that he like was coming down the mountain on Sunday in the afternoon, saw this woman who looked to be the Isdal woman um, being followed by two men. But then you th- like when he you think about it is the woman, the Isdal woman was found on the Sunday morning. So like her her remains had already been found. I myself personally would think that the police would have like taped off half the mountain or a good chunk of the mountains to prevent hikers from going in. So like you just You don't know with the eyewitness testimonies, which is difficult because that's a lot of what this case is based off of. But there's so Mm -hmm. many discrepancies. And it also doesn't help that they just give like, oh, this happened on Monday and this happened on Sunday. And I'm like, "Uh, but which Sunday? (laughs) Give me the date. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because my understanding of that would have been like it took place the Sunday before she went missing like on November 22nd. Yeah. But yeah, we don't know. Like Sunday is could have been like last any Sunday, right? Sunday. Like, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and another thing is, like, some of them came forward, like, after the podcast came out. Yeah. That was a lot of the, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, like, and got their interview in and, yeah. Yeah. The only, like, person that I actually believe their story is the shoe shop owner. Yeah. In Stavanger because they talked to him, like, the police talked to him. Yeah. As well. And then the podcast went back 50 years later and talked to him again. Yeah. It's, it but was him or his that, son, like, something like that. The connection yeah, between Yeah, because it was them. the son who sold the shoes to him, and then mm. it was the son they talked to again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that makes sense. at least. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and like with all these discrepancies with the eyewitness testimonies, eyewitnesses have also, though, described her as having muscular thighs and wide hips, um, which was interesting, but the remains discovered um, don't really show this. And the remains also show – go ahead. Um, I, sorry. I was just going to say that fat burns faster than uh, muscle. So yeah. if she did have big thighs, it would have melted away. Yeah. Like yeah. it's an accelerant. It just goes quickly. I just wanted to add that. Yeah. And then her autopsy and remains also showed that she had never been pregnant or was not pregnant at the time. So like, I I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with wide hips, muscular thighs, but it's just another physical characteristic about her. Um, Some more discrepancies are that DNA testing, when that was done after the case reopened, uh, they found that it puts her kind of somewhere between 26 and 44 But eyewitness testimony puts her as young as 25. And then this guy was saying, you know, she could look as young as 18. I find this a very subjective way of aging someone, though, because I am god awful at guessing someone's age. Like you could put a 40 year old in front of me and I could either say 75 or 30 and I would have no idea, obviously given on the certain person. But like, I feel like to trust everyone's word on that age, I don't know. A little, a little sus to me. Well, it is very subjective of, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And like now that like my parents are like getting close to being 50, like even like and Bryce's parents, like the later ends of 40s, like 
It's not that old. No. Oh, gosh, Like, yes, I might not think they look 25. Sorry, Mom. But, (laughs) (laughs) like... I definitely wouldn't have been like it wouldn't be impossible for her yeah. to look younger than she is, right? Like and I feel like that's something that especially nowadays, not to get off on a rabbit hole, but people expect that women age worse, like they don't yeah. age well. Yeah. And I don't know why that is. Like people are so shocked when they're like, "Oh, like Jennifer Aniston is like 55. Like, oh my gosh, she <laughs> wow. looks so good." It's like, "Yes, because once we turn 30, we don't start rapidly decaying." Yeah. Like, that's just not something that happens. So, yeah, I just, I feel like guessing how old people look is, yeah, so subjective and not very accurate whatsoever. And I think, too, like, for that time period, for it to be 1970, I just feel like everyone that, from the photos I've seen of people during that time, they all look so much more mature than they, like, actually are. Like, they look very different from, like, like a 25 year old back in 1970 would look i in my opinion much older than a 25 year old now obviously in depending on circumstances but like majority on average um that would be the case um yeah which i find i don't know again just subjectivity um yeah. But with this DNA too, DNA also linked her to Germany and then witnesses though described her as having like an exotic appearance and she was described of having like a, what was it, Balkan accent was one? Mm -hmm. Is that the problem? Yeah. And then um, a different European, Southern European, I believe was another accent region. I know that's a large region, but... um, not Scandinavian accent. Yeah. And like, what does the term exotic even mean? Yeah. I hate that to describe someone. I really do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Because like between the three of us, like you with blonde hair could look more exotic than Uh, to certain people. Yeah. You would look similar with brunette hair, but it's like, we're all Canadian. (laughs) To us, we're just white women. (laughs) Like, not (laughs) exactly. What exotic are you looking for? Really? Yeah, that's also just such a subjective term. Um, Another kind of big, like, while there are a lot of discrepancies with this case, another one was that nothing on uh, that was found had fingerprints except the sunglasses or the glasses that were in the suitcase. So you would think that she's touching everything in her case, but somehow only the the glasses had crappy fingerprints on them and that's what they use to uh for their investigation yeah it's really strange like that feels like none planted. of the cosmetics i'm not saying yeah. it is but yeah like, like you, you would, would think definitely the cosmetics think- or the stuff she's holding regularly to use would have something yeah exactly or the early like eczema cream or mm-hmm. like the passports like yeah, yeah everything in that should have had fingerprints of some sort yeah yeah and it kind of is like, why didn't they? Were they like rubbed yeah. off or were the sunglasses planted? Or were they like, just crap at taking fingerprints? I would not be surprised because with this investigation. <laughs> the fingerprints on the sunglasses are good. Like they got a really, really good fingerprint off that. But the fingerprints they took off the body were yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Right? Like who knows? And yeah, why, why were there no other fingerprints anywhere? And then you go back to the whole, it's 1970. What standards are they <laughs> working with to match How these fingerprints? How many points comparison? How, yeah, yeah, exactly. Is it one and they're like, oh, that's it? Or are they going the whole ten, nine yards? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So her case was closed early 1971, um, only like two months after her body was found. And so... Um, before it was closed on December 22nd in 1970, police held a press conference and stated that suicide was the most likely cause of death. And given the amount of sleeping pills found in her system, authorities ruled her um, death a suicide and the case was uh, consequently closed by police. However, many people, including a lot of people on the police force, didn't agree with this decision and wanted more answers. Um, She was given a Catholic funeral and burial in Bergen Cemetery in February 5th, 1971. 
Uh, she was buried in a zinc coffin to preserve her remains so that if they need to exhume her in the future, her body isn't too decomposed. I didn't know this was a thing you could do, and I find it very interesting. Um, yeah, I've never heard of that, especially zinc being used. Mm-hmm, yeah. So I'd kind of like to look into how that works because it's very curious. Um it's also curious that she was given a Catholic funeral because suicide in the eyes of the Catholic Church is a mortal sin, and they will not allow suicide victims to be buried in Catholic cemeteries or have Catholic funerals. So I don't know if I don't know how that happened, but I'm glad that she did get a funeral. Um, and her case was reopened in 2016, and the Norwegian Broadcasting Company commissioned an American artist named Stephen Missel to create six alternative composite sketches of the Istal woman, uh, which were shown to people who had seen her and had given eyewitness testimony of her throughout the years after the case. We'll put up a comparison of like the new sketches and the previous sketch. Um, and we would really like to hear your opinions on the um, like original 1970s sketch because it's not great. Yeah. It just kind of looks like it was drawn by a child. Um, yeah, I think I have a similar one in my like childhood memento bin that looks yeah. very much like that. Yeah, so I'm happy to see how far uh, composite sketches have come in the last 50 years. Uh, and so also in 2016, the security services released the Istal Woman's file to journalists, and they revealed new information about the case that was kept highly classified for 46 years. And the files didn't have any evidence of spy agencies interfering with the investigation or shutting it down because one of the main theories was that the Estelle woman was a spy and that the agency that she worked for kind of shut down the investigation and that's why it was closed so soon after she was found. However, on December 22nd, when the police were giving their press conference declaring her death a suicide, a message was sent by the Armed Forces High Command Security Department and the message said, quote, Woman found dead in Isdalin, Isdalin, probably observed Tenanger in November while tests with Penguin were carried out. The woman was also in Stavanger while similar tests were performed in April, end quote. I think we talk about this a little bit later on in the theory section, so I won't go into it too much right now. Um, these new files also showed that her trip to Trondheim coincided with two GRU agents in the city. Again, we're going to kind of talk about that in the theory section yeah, so isotope analysis was conducted uh, on her teeth, and it showed or suggested that she was born sometime between 1926 and 1934. Uh, this is supported also by carbon-14 dating of her teeth and AAR analysis, which puts her birth year at uh, 1932. So this, of course, is kind of contradictory of what she was writing on all of the hotel logs where her birthday was between 1943 and 45. And it also kind of just leads to more confusion around her real uh, age, just given like how much discrepancy was in everyone's eyewitness testimony of her appearance. Um but it also indicated uh, the analysis that she had dental work in South America, East Asia, or Central or Southern Europe. Um, and the analysis of the enamel of her teeth showed that she spent most of her childhood somewhere along the border of Germany, France, Luxembourg, and Belgium. And then around age 14, she most likely moved uh, west from Eastern or Central Europe. And this took place before or during World War II. And due to receiving French schooling, as it is believed, it's likely that her family had fled before the Second World War to the French-speaking uh, Walloon region of Belgium or into northern France near the border. So... The DNA um, taken from her body belongs to Norwegian police, technically, and oddly, they don't allow material to be run through commercial databases such as Ancestry. Um, this is unlike the US. I'm not sure if it's unlike Canada. I don't know if Canada allows that or not. Um, I didn't know that this was like something that they weren't allowed to do. Yeah, I always thought that well, now, because we've talked about the ethics behind it, so I knew it like wasn't always done, but with the emergence of it, I thought it was kind of like 
everyone, every department could have access. I didn't realize it was country by country. Same. Um, but as of 2019, uh, none of us were really able to find anything beyond this date. But as of 2019, there was a legal hearing planned to see whether police in Norway would be able to uh, put the Isdal woman's DNA into these databases. Uh, if anyone has heard about that, let us know, because, again, we couldn't find anything. Um, but they did end up getting a full DNA profile. Didn't have a reference sample. Wait, sorry. So, like, they, they, have, have, full, they have her full DNA profile, but they have nothing to compare it to. So, like, Interpol and all of those, like, police law enforcement databases, they can compare it to that. But there's like sh- there's no sample. She's not in any She's of them. Not in any of them. yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, so that's gotcha. why like yeah. they want to try and do like what they did with the Golden State Killer, like try and flink her through family ties through her ancestry. Like Gen Bank, yeah, like Gen or like Bank. genealogy, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So like that's what current internet investigators think could help identify her and it just seems so easy enough for them to be like oh pop this in compare and we'd have an answer but they haven't done that yeah and even if they had genealogy is a very yeah intensive research to go (laughs) down i feel like genealogy is just a massive rabbit hole and then you eventually get where you want to (laughs) go um but Nicole, thank you for clearing up my confusion there because <laughs> you could hear the confusion in my voice as I read that. <laughs> um, so moving on now, um, that was thank you, Journey and Nicole, um, for giving us the whole case study and kind of what we know to date or what we at least think we know to date. <laughs> um, but we wanted to get into some of the theories surrounding her death because there are many theories surrounding it and no one actually knows what happened or which one is true so it just leaves people to constantly speculate there's probably at least like 50 different theories being supported by other people right now um but the first theory and one of the most popular was that some think she was a soviet spy because she died in the middle of the cold war um Some also think that she worked for the Mossad, but she didn't have any Jewish heritage. So this is somewhat supported, the spy theory, um, but very loosely, by the fact that she wasn't the only suspicious death in Norway around this time. Um, For example, there were at least two cases in the 1960s of people who were also potentially suspected to be spies. Um, They died in very suspicious circumstances. Uh, One died by ingesting cyanide. He was found against a tree. And another one was just found on a beach with all of her clothing labels removed and burned in a fire. So that does lead some um, kind of similarities to the Isdal woman's case. But it also leads us to wonder why we know so much about the Isdal woman and why her case is so famous, but the other mysterious deaths that happened around the time are basically unheard of. So staying with the idea that she was a KGB spy, someone had to have financed her travel around Europe and her fake passports had to have been good enough to get her in and out of many countries. Some witness statements even linked her um, being in the in the vicinity of military rocket tests um, in the 70s and 60s when they were occurring. There were some documents that are now declassified and they reveal that some of her visits actually corresponded with top secret trials of the Penguin missile. For example, on March 24th of 1970, missile boats were in Bergen and so was the Isdal woman. In April of 1970, the team was conducting tests in Stavanger, and the Isdal woman was also in Stavanger. In October, sorry, October 29th, new tests were done of the missile in Stavanger, and the Isdal woman once again was there. And finally, November 9th, even more missile tests were conducted in Stavanger, and it was also confirmed that the Isdal woman once again was in the vicinity. So, of course, there were plenty of people within the vicinity of these as they occurred, but she was the only one with a suspicious death, and we don't know who she is. 
Um, it was reported that the entire operation was under surveillance from the USSR, and every time they went to test a Soviet ship, um, sorry, um, and every time they went to test the missile, a Soviet ship would show up just outside of the shooting range. Surprise! Who would have thought? <laughs> oh, we're here! <laughs> um, so... Because of the hotel forms that she filled out, um, being a, like they were full of mistakes and she used different password numbers and names, um, it's unlikely, or at least it's not likely that she was actually a spy. Generally, someone who's a spy uses one airtight alias that basically they just take on that role. They are this new person while they're a spy and they are very, very careful not to make mistakes that could identify them as a spy. And it's also probably part of the reason you've probably heard (laughs) the stereotype of spies. That's like carrying around a cyanide pill. And if their identity is found, there they go. So it's a little weird that she'd have like eight identities. Um, It's also, she could, sorry to interrupt. Like it comes back to the whole, like, the more identities you have, the more lies you have to tell, and the more mm-hmm. there is for you to get caught up in those lies. Like there, it's just she's setting herself up to be caught at that point. If that's if she was really a spy, yeah. And another yeah. thing, like um, the the podcast supposedly talked to like an ex KGB agent or a mm-hmm. spy or whatever. And um, he was like, yeah, like if she was a Russian spy, like she wouldn't smell of garlic. She would smell of Chanel number five. I hate the smell of Chanel number five. So I would describe it as someone who smelled bad, like the shop owner. So it's like, oh, did she smell bad or did she smell like Chanel number five? We may never know because some people like it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I can say I know what Chanel number five smells like, but... Um, I do know it's a popular perfume, so. Well, I made a point to smell it the last time I was in the airport because I always, like, you go through, like, the duty-free area. Yeah. And they always have the expensive stuff. So I was like, I've always wondered what this smells like. And I smelled it, and I was like, that's disgusting. (laughs) (laughs) Good to know they're just paying for the name brand. Just paying for the brand. Exactly. (laughs) It might just be my own personal preference. Like, I don't know, but it was not for me. So that was something that I thought of. Yeah. Yeah, it's very possible because I mean, every, I mean, even scent is subjective. Like, not yeah. every. It's like I know cilantro is more of a taste thing than a smell thing, but like some people think it smells like. Or we talked about cilantro in like the last episode. I don't know why it's like we? popping lately. <laughs> I think we did recently, but yeah, just like some people think it tastes like soap. Some people think it tastes good. Like it's just it's a matter of your brain chemistry and yeah. your taste buds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so, even like a friend of mine hates um, like vanilla scented perfumes, but loves the flowery ones. And I'm the exact opposite. Like oh. I hate a flowery perfume, but I love like the sweet vanilla ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's really hard to say she smelled bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially once they start saying they smelled like a certain food. Because yeah, yeah, it's very everything in this seems subjective. Everything <laughs> is subjective. Just kind of finishing off the whole like theory of is she a spy? Is she not a spy? Um, she could have been a courier as well, like kind of receiving and giving messages to those who associated with the military, because that would kind of put her in like a, a sensitive, like confidential kind of situation without being such a top level as a spy and needs to maintain those lies. Mm-hmm. Um There is one website that we will link that does an amazing job compiling all of the different possibilities of who she could have been. Um, So if you want to know more, definitely check out that link. Um, I know that we've mentioned a lot in this episode. Check out this link. Check out this photo. (laughs) So this will just be really helpful sources. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) just look at them. All of them. (laughs) There's so many theories like this. I feel like this is one of those rabbit holes that... Yeah. It's really easy to fall in, and we might just be the introduction to it. Or yeah. maybe we are part of your rabbit hole, and you've already been down it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. I never thought about that. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that was just one of one or two of the very many theories. 
Um, but we kind of just wanted to go into now a little bit of a discussion about each of our each of our theories or just like thoughts about these sources. Um, Cause I know we all had a lot to say <laughs> throughout the episode, mm-hmm. even though we didn't plan on it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Is there anything either of you would like to kind of start this discussion off with anything you felt was like peculiar or not so great that deserves like the first place in here? Um, I think the first place should be the BBC podcast that we all uh, listen to. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the only like reliable, maybe reliable is not the right word, but everyone views it as a reliable source of information because yeah. it's so well known. Yeah. Um, I hated it. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> and I'm really sorry. I We shouldn't be talking negative about other podcasts, but it didn't feel like in like journalistic integrity yeah. was there mm-hmm. was all there like i bet the two hosts are lovely lovely people like i'm sure they are amazing at what they do it's just from like a forensics viewpoint and like how we as students learned to approach things and like interrogate and all of that stuff like it was it was a very f- in my opinion, fictional approach. And it made mm-hmm. you think you were listening to like an audio book almost rather than a real life true crime case that was happening and like is still open to this day. It was also I felt just- very much the same. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Journey to cut you off. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I was going to say that it was also just um, very – Hard, very hard to listen to because it had like rain playing in the background or like crackling f- sounds or like people walking. It was and dramatized so it, or whatever the word mm-hmm, is. Yeah. Very much so. And so it was very, very difficult to listen to because I don't know if I'm biased, but I like our format where it's just us talking. Yeah. And there's no like music going on in the background or whatever because often I couldn't hear what the people were saying especially because they were speaking with an accent and I had trouble understanding them. So I was like listening even harder. But then if there was like rain falling in the background, I couldn't hear. Yeah. Like, yeah, I agree. Their audio was somewhat quiet and we're not, (laughs) I mean, I know we're in no place to talk talk about, (laughs) yeah, no place to talk. And this also isn't the place to talk about audio and the technicality of podcasting (laughs) Um, but as someone that gets very distracted very easily uh and i think everyone i know can attest to that i just get really distracted when there's like background noise or like they're not focusing all of like what attention should be on the main topic but Mm -hmm. that's not relevant that's just (laughs) me expressing opinions that's just personal (laughs) preference um, well, I have a whole list. <laughs> if, I, if, if you want to start with my, my, my notes here as starting points and we can go off of them. Um, one, though, I, we've already talked about this, but like the police covering up, not, okay, maybe covering up is not the right word, but suspect things happening within the investigation that the police were in charge of a little suspect right like yeah like it's it's weird that so much evidence was lost yeah 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 mm-hmm. that's the biggest thing because we've talked about a lot of cases and we're not even close to scratching the surface on the amount of crime cases that involved are like that happened in the world in all time Evidence doesn't typically go missing just like that. Yeah. You know? And it feels like, I don't know if this is just like, if they threw it out because they like ran out of space or like statute of limitations passed or whatever. Yeah. But it feels like if you're going to like keep the body in a special coffin that allows for it to like slow decomp, that you should also be keeping the evidence just in case. Yeah, I agree. I also wonder about like... I worked a summer and I was only like, like I was like an administrative assistant or assistant at a police station one summer, it, but they gave me a tour of the building and yes, they did say that there's some evidence they throw out. Like if a case is definitively closed, you know, but they had a full locker full of evidence that they are legally not allowed to throw out. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like for cases of unidentified people, they shouldn't 
like isn't there laws in place or like regulations that they need to keep this for further I like it might be different because they ruled her case a suicide and then they closed it. So yeah, it might have been like the case where they're like, okay, we can throw it out. But given how many people even on the police force on this case didn't believe it was a suicide, Mm -hmm. like I I just feel like it does feel a bit like (laughs) there was an effort to hide something. Yeah. Um. Uh, next point. Uh, why was her hair still present enough to be noted as being up in a ponytail and the color if she was burnt? Like you would think, personally, I would think, you may have an answer to this journey, but I would think if my top half was burnt, my hair's going. That is some pretty flammable stuff. So how was her hair still up in a ponytail? See, that's like a piece of evidence <laughs> that I found kind of like um, like changed Uh, depending on the source like some sources were like oh there was no hair some sources were like yes it was tied up in a ponytail with a blue and white ribbon but it's like how do we know that and then some other sources were like oh the wig doesn't mean she was a spy and wanted to change her appearance maybe she had alopecia because like yeah her um due to the burning on her scalp like we can't tell Um, what hair was naturally there so it's that would make more sense I just didn't right? understand that, like, how are you, where are you getting this pony? Like, is this a, mm-hmm. she was alive last sighting was when her hair was in a ponytail? But why are some sources saying she was found like that? Right? Yeah. And, like, a lot of the, um, like, images that are, like, composite sketches or whatever show her with bangs. Yeah. But it's, like, how do we know her face was burned? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. How do we know she had brown eyes? How do we know she had small ears? How do we know she had a round face? Like her body it's, was burned. It's all eyewitness. Mm-hmm. And we know what they say about eyewitness. But yeah, like she was burned to the point of boxer's pose. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping people who don't know what it is, like after we explain it and they see like the diagrams and Journey's wonderful explanation, because she knows very much about <laughs> this stuff. Um Bodies aren't recognizable when they when no. they're in that pose. They are mm-hmm. burned beyond recognition. So there's a lot like unless they pulled her DNA to see, oh, she had brown eyes, she had brunette hair. Like it is kind of speculative. Speculatory? <laughs> speculative. One of those. <laughs> One yeah, of those. Well, things. even like they didn't have DNA in 1970. Like it didn't come into play till 1985. So it's yeah. like Speaking. we really we really don't know. We we that's that should be the title of this episode. We just really do not know. <laughs> okay, I'll make it that. <laughs> um, speaking of the boxers pose, though, I had a thought. Do you think the amount of sleeping pills in her system somehow had an influence then on the boxers pose? Could they somehow influence the evaporation of moisture from her muscles during the fire process, speeding up that? like boxer pose situation um i think we would need to know more about the pills the chemical makeup of because i know they were she would take barbiturates like she took sleeping pills that were like i don't know the proper name like the proper chemical mm-hmm. class of barbiturates but i know those are what she took and i don't think any of us quite have the extensive knowledge to know how much liquid they could absorb yeah so i did find an article that said (gasps) the amount of chemical in her body was only enough to have a calming influence it wasn't enough to make her go fully to sleep it was just like taking like anxiety medication to like because the 50 to 70 hadn't absorbed the amount that was left like okay organs in the bloodstream was only enough to like calm her down had all 50 to 70 of those absorbed, yes, yeah. dead as a door. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but then it also begs the question, so like assuming she took the pills, then was burned, because she was burned at least at to some degree burned alive because there was soot in her lungs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's you. I would not be calm. She take, <laughs> no, but did she take the pills like so quickly before she died they couldn't all be absorbed or was it simply like way too many pills you know what i mean yeah. back to pills next point was it a costco size freaking pill bottle like <laughs> how did she get so many fi- so many pills 
of barbiturates especially right? however it was the 70s and i don't know how pharmacies and prescriptions worked we're talking like this is the middle ages we're I know. not that young yeah. and that's not that <laughs> old but it, it was we just don't time. have the experience from that time <laughs> yeah so she was taking i think it was called like phenomol um okay. and they have pictures of like um similar bottles that it would have been prescribed in but yeah like how many pills were actually like i don't know how many pills normally come in a bottle of like prescribed medication so prescribed i don't know because that could vary like i get anywhere between like one you could do like two weeks to like three months kind of thing if it's Mm -hmm. prescribed to you so i don't know if this was a prescription prescription or if you could just get over the counter barbiturates like i don't know if that's a possibility i'm gonna assume not But, like, when I Googled or just thinking back to, like, whenever I needed a medication from Shoppers Drug Mart, say, like, they only really go up to maybe, like, max 50. So, like, did she have, like, two bottles of that? And is she just taking them, like, eating them like popcorn? Is she feeding them to herself? Is someone else force feeding them? There's so many questions. Well, yeah, because if it's not a suicide... Yeah, okay. how were they? How'd they get into her system? Sorry to interrupt you, Rebecca. No, you pretty much said what I was gonna say. It's just um, like was like I know they said it was suicide because of the amount of pills in her system, mm-hmm. but then that's like on one hand, if you think it's suicide because there's fifty to seventy pills, does that mean she willingly burned herself because she didn't think it was gonna work, or vice versa? She tried to burn herself didn't work so she took pills did someone force all of this on them like there's just there's no way they could have ruled her suicide based on what they found within two months yeah exactly okay uh next point of conversation um do you think someone could have killed and burned her elsewhere and then moved her and like all of her stuff to kind of like you said, Journey, when you're talking about it, like stage the crime scene. Because if her back's not as burnt as her front, that makes me speculate that she was laying on her back, cover- which was covered by something preventing it from being burned as she was being burned. Where her body was, was like wedged in between rocks. And there's it looks to be as though there's airflow under her body. So you would think that the underside would also be burnt. So then that leads me to believe she was killed and maybe burned somewhere else and then like thrown down somewhere, like down the mountainside. Well, I think there's like, there's not obviously like concrete evidence of that, but yeah, given the state of her body, like all the burns, all that stuff, but she was found laying in such a peculiar place paired with the lack of like evidence of a fire anywhere in the vicinity of it. Mm -hmm. And also that all of her stuff was neatly laid out and there's no signs of like a struggle or anything. Like, I don't think she could have put herself where she was. Yeah. No. Without any, like, cause she wouldn't burn herself and then walk to where she was and then do what she needs to do. So it, yeah, I just have a lot of thoughts running through my mind right now about <laughs> how she was likely placed there, but yeah. Yeah. By who? I I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Words can be hard sometimes. <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> yes. Um kind of to touch on the bruise on her neck journey, I need your scientific body input on this knowledge. Um would this bruise develop post-mortem though? Like, I don't understand. Like, I would think that the bruise happened before she died and not during her death because her body would need to develop the bruise. But that wouldn't happen dur- while she was dead. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, but I... Because in TV shows, um, <laughs> they do have like... <laughs> like a trauma that happens like that you occurred during yeah like the struggle of your death or whatever so yeah it definitely could have um happened at the time of death as well but with bruises you can you can't prove when yeah they happen because each body heals at a different rate and i actually don't know anything about this bruise it did not show up on any of the articles that i read um yeah so where was it placed like was it like someone like grabbed her throat or like 
it just yeah, said there was a bruise else. on her neck. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder that too. Like, was it the entire neck? Was it like just along, like, say, the jugular? Was it on the back of her neck? Like, which yeah. I feel like just so like. Sorry to interrupt. I was just gonna say, oh, like, I, I didn't have anything good to say. Like, where the location of the bruise was would tell you a lot about kind of the circumstances. Um. <laughs> My theory, one of my theories was like, maybe she was just a theater kid. And that's why she had all of those, like, uh, costumes, not costumes, <laughs> but like, whatever. And I was like, that She's just make- practicing all of her, yeah. all of her acts. Exactly. She's in so many shows. Um, two questions I had, though, based off the conversations we had. With her cosmetics, with none of the labels being on, could they have just rubbed off over time? Like, just being worn off? Because during that time, like, the cosmetic containers didn't have from my knowledge like the plastic labels that we have now that could like maybe peel off yeah it would be interesting to see how used they were yeah because like i don't like i don't have any cosmetics that i've rubbed the label off of but i have like highlighters that i bought yeah. from the dollar store that i can rub the label off of yeah and so maybe it's something like that yeah, yeah. i do briefly remember and i say briefly because like you guys were saying like the articles all blend together and they all have such like contradictory information. (laughs) Um, But if I remember correctly, while I was reading and watching and listening to things, um, the police were not able to even figure out what company the makeup came from. Like even though they didn't have labels, which I just find bizarre because again, don't know how makeup was in the seventies, but I'd still assume that it was like mass manufactured and that like each brand mm-hmm. would kind of have their own like bottles or their yeah. own formulas and stuff. So the fact that they weren't able to figure that out is really strange and kind of leads me to think like maybe it was a brand that's not available in Norway. Ooh, but yeah. I don't know how like I don't know how far that would lead them. So that's probably why they didn't look on it further. Yeah. Yeah. They only had like a month to get this minuscule amount of information that they had on this case. Like if they had continued to maybe investigate it a little bit more and had followed these leads, then perhaps they could have learned something. Right. But instead of just being like, Oh, this person died from suicide and the case, it leaves no one. It gives no one time to come forward. Like a month isn't a lot of time. No, not at all. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it closed very, very fast. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, yeah everything else we've kind of talked about that I had mentioned, yeah. like, thought of. Well, even along with the makeup, like, the removing of the clothing tags, like, I wouldn't have thought to remove <laughs> tags of clothing. But then I also kind of thought um, maybe she was autistic and didn't like the feelings <laughs> of tags say. on her. Yeah, well, <laughs> it could be a sensory <laughs> issue. <laughs> Right, yeah, honestly, I cut tag, off like yeah. every tag on my clothing, so that is like mm. totally reasonable. Even the shirt I'm wearing now has no tags. I cut yeah. them off as soon as I got it. Yeah, exactly. So it's like it's really not that weird when you think about something like that. But then something we haven't talked about is like mental illness. Maybe this yeah. was a suicide attempt. It doesn't she feel could be like just it to me. N- I I am like ninety eight percent confident of ruling out suicide. I will be mm-hmm. honest it's just the circumstances of how she was found don't make sense with that um yeah if she hadn't been burned maybe but yeah yeah, yeah it's the yeah. fire that really kind of makes this very questionable yeah i agree um but yeah, absolutely we have so many theories so if anyone wants to discuss some theories or has theories of their own please reach out to us yeah comment on our pictures and stuff or email Mm -hmm. or anything let us know what you think because there's probably still some that we have not talked about um Mm -hmm. before we started recording this we were taking a look at an uh a website where this guy goes over 34 theories he himself has thought of so uh i'm sure there's more out there that have to be discussed and we want to hear your opinions yeah and maybe if we get some good theories and stuff from listeners like It'd be fun to do some update posts like <gasps> yeah. on the East All Woman and some theories that we've we've all come up with or you've come up with. And this is a really interesting case that is I honestly don't know if it'll ever be solved, but theorizing yeah. about it is a lot of fun. Yeah. I think because and, like there's nothing yeah. concrete. Like you're just going in circles. There's so many avenues you could take with it. 
And you don't have any evidence to compare it to. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just so, kind of creating evidence in your own story at that point. Yeah. I don't know. Unsolved cases really bother me because I just want to know what the answer is. Yeah. I know. There's no closure. Yeah. Um, but with all of that, thank you, Journey and Nicole, very much for telling us about the case of the Isdal woman. Um, I know our conversation sometimes felt a little bit rambly, but I feel like that's the only way you can truly talk about this case. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, there's just there's so many theories and there's so much contradicting information on like every article and everything you look at. Um which is why we would absolutely love to hear from our listeners on what they think happened. Maybe go through some of our sources. There's some pretty cool ones, um, including one with a bunch of like actual footage during the investigation. Like they, uh, they have the, I think like the press conference from the police when they were trying to figure out like whether it was a suicide or a spy. Cause they did think it could have been a spy at, in the seventies. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but thank you guys so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, you very well might enjoy the next one because it is very loosely related. Uh, we will be covering Edward Snowden and espionage. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, Nicole, would you care to tell our lovely listeners where they can find us? I would love to so much. So our listeners can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at What the Forensics. Um, we do have a Twitter. We do not use said Twitter all that often. So maybe don't find us there, but we have one. So if you get bored, find us over there. Um, and that is WT Forensics PC. Our website is whattheforensics.ca. There, as we've kind of been mentioning all throughout the episode, that's where you can find our sources, our source images, um, everything about us. There's a contact form there just if you have any questions, concerns, comments. And then our email is also whattheforensics at gmail.com. And feel free to reach out to us that way as well. All right. And thank you very much, Nicole. Um, and just before we go, if you wanted to leave us a review anywhere, whether it be through our website's contact page, whether you want to email us or send us a review through Facebook, uh, we would be so appreciative of it, of it. We love to hear from our listeners and everything they have to say. Um, we do like positive reviews, but if you have <laughs> some concerns, we would love to hear that too. Cause we want to know how we can do better. Constructive um, criticism, please. Constructive yeah, criticism. Yeah, make like a compliment sandwich. <laughs> yeah. You know, some nice, some good stuff and put the bad stuff inside. <laughs> um, yeah, but thank you guys so much for listening to another episode of What the Forensics. We really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we sure did have fun kind of speculating and theorizing on this episode and we'll see you next time bye just a reminder to everyone that we are not professionals in the forensic science field we are just interested in forensics and want to share what we are learning with our listeners we're trying to give you the most accurate information but we are human and can make mistakes thank you so much for listening and we hope to see you next week Mm -hmm.